So there we go. Okay, and let me launch this poll now. Okay. So there you go. So it should be coming up. Um, have you participated in Erasmus Plus or EU funded project before? And you have the option to answer yes, more than one. Yes, just one so far or not yet. So we will give everybody a minute to answer. Okay. So we have got um, a fairly good spread in the room. So 63% have not yet participated in Erasmus Plus project. Um, and 33% have participated in more than one and 3% have participated in one so far. So hopefully um, the newcomers will get a lot of inspiration today. Um, and for people that have already participated in Erasmus projects, you'll get some more motivation to continue kind of scaling up and expanding your experience with Erasmus Plus funding. So that is it for me for now. So Siobhan, I am gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. We still had a few people coming in there. So uh, let me do that now. Great. Uh, and just to start off by saying that um, you will all get a copy. I'm assuming Emily of the uh, yeah of the the slides afterwards. So don't worry too much about the the content and, and writing down the content of the slides. You'll have those afterwards. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, uh, Emily, and the wheel to um, and thank you for hosting this uh, spe a specific workshop webinar on Erasmus Plus funding for vocational education and training. So as Emily said, I'm Siobhan Wallace and I have been working in the national agency, Largus specifically, for well about just over 18 years. Um, and I'm also part of the European Commission's working group of national agencies. And we give input into the design and development of the programme. And for me, that's specifically for partnership projects. And I've been doing that for about 15 years. So I certainly have a lot of time spent, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, I suppose, countries covered as well uh, during my time. Um, working with Largus. So I'm really happy to be talking specifically today um, about partnership projects. And we're looking specifically at partnership projects in the fields of vocational education and training. Now, I'm conscious that there's a mixture of newcomers. Um, uh, I think Emily showed about 60 something percent there, um, but also some organiza organizations with experience. But my main aim is to provide an introduction to partnership projects in vocational education training field. Um, and often we provide, when we're providing um, training or application or information sessions, we often provide a cross-sectoral overview at these workshops. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to have a specific focus on vocational education and training at this webinar. And hopefully even those of you who have participated in Erasmus Plus already will get something uh, additional because we're focusing on vocational education and training and because um, small scale partnerships are specifically um, there for newcomer organizations we're going to focus specifically on small scale partnerships but we'll be covering both uh, types of partnership projects and we'll explain a bit more about that later so I'm going to cover the kind of who, where, what, when um, and how of partnership projects. So we'll start off with the what. So Erasmus Plus is the uh, EU's funding program for education, training, youth and sport. And it kicked off in 2021. It runs for seven years, so it will finish in 2027. So we're kind of coming up to about the halfway point at this stage almost. It has an overall budget of 26 billion euros. So quite a pot, really. And as you can see there in that little um, that little pie chart, you can see that the mobility function or action that we call it of the program, that attracts about 70% of the funding. So it's very much a focus on mobility and exchange, but there's also 
30% of the program is focused on partnerships and partnerships in exchange. So quite a significant amount of funding when you break down that 26 billion euros. And as I mentioned, the partnership projects that we're focusing on today, they come under key action too. Um, Erasmus Plus talks about different key actions um, and mobility comes under key action one and partnership projects come under key action two. And the title of key action two is cooperation among organizations and institutions. And some of those strands under key action two, such as partnerships cooperation, they're decentralized. So the, the idea is that they're managed by national agencies in each country so that the program can be a bit more accessible to uh, the participants of those countries rather than being hosted at a centralized level by the European Commission, which maybe can make it seem a bit harder to, um, harder to I suppose, be able to access really. So we're focusing on partnerships for cooperation. That itself is broken down into small scale partnerships and cooperation partnerships. So we'll take a look at both of those this morning. There are other strands under cooperation, uh, opportunities for cooperation under Erasmus Plus Key Action 2, such as partnerships for innovation, partnerships for excellence, and not for profit European sports event, but we're not looking at those today. They're centralized projects and they're run by the European Commission executive agency who themselves host information webinars and workshops when there is an upcoming call. So today we'll just focus on the partnerships for cooperation and those are the ones that Lergus and other national agencies in each country manage. So what are the objectives? Another what? The objectives are to improve the quality of work activities and practices of organizations and institutions involved. And it does this by inviting maybe new actors who might not, you might not typically work with. And also by working with different countries and different sectors across different countries. So it helps organizations to develop skills that they need to work across different countries so that they can cooperate uh, and operate themselves more effectively. And then it's about working together to focus on common needs and priorities in the fields of education, training and youth. And it's about encouraging individual organizations and industries to transform and change for the better. And the hope is that that will lead to new improved approaches that are um, appropriate for each organization's unique context that they work in. And then the strand of small scale partnerships was introduced in 2021. And that's about really making the program more accessible to newcomers and less experienced organizations by forming partnerships that serve as a starting point. So it's really like an entry point uh, for working at European cooperation level. And it's also about in promoting the inclusion of target groups. So by making it more open to newcomers and less experienced organizations, it promotes inclusion and especially for target groups that face greater obstacles to participation and also about promoting active European citizen citizenship and bringing the European perspective to a local level. So those are the main objectives. So what funding is available? Well, that depends on the type of project you're applying for. As I said, there's cooperation partnerships, which are larger partnerships. And that's the one that we're going to hear about from the wheel uh, just after this presentation. They are they can be set up by at least three different organizations from three different countries for a duration of between one to three years. And it's lump sum funding for these type of par uh, partnership projects. So you either apply for a grant of 120,000, 250,000 or 400,000. And that um, you have to kind of decide which option suits you best uh, and, and which amount of funding is more, most suitable for what you want to try and do. And just to note that that funding is for across the partnership. It's not for one organization. It's the funding is spread across the whole partnership. For small scale partnerships, the funding is obviously less. You have two grant options, either 30,000 or 60,000. But the difference is that you only need two organizations from two different program countries to participate. And they can be shorter in duration. They can last just between six months and two years. So who can be involved in these type of projects? Well, basically any public or private organization that's established in an EU member state or a country that's known as a third country associated to the program. And 
these third countries associated to the program, some of them might be accession countries for the EU. Uh, others have really close ties with the EU. So they're, they're known as third countries associated to the program. So just to run through those, that's the member states of the EU, then North Macedonia, Serbia, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Turkey. And just to note very importantly, that the UK is not eligible to participate as a partner in a small scale partnership project. So the UK is no longer a programme country, an EU member state, or it's no longer a third country associated to the programme. So that's something to bear in mind when you're thinking of participating in these in these programs. Now, there is kind of a, a situation where a UK partner can participate in a cooperation partnership project. Um, but that's really is an exception. So just to understand as a rule, the UK cannot participate as a partner in these type of projects. And, you know, looking a bit more about what are small scale partnerships, because I said we would focus specifically on those for the newcomers. Well, they're really about acting as the first step for organisations into European cooperation. And it's about allowing organisations to build capacity to work at an international level and to avail of some of the benefits that can come with working at this level. And we look at some of those benefits later on. So as a newcomer, it's really an organisation that hasn't previously received support um, in that particular action by the programme or has um, or, or the previous program and also there's an opportunity for less experienced organizations so that's an, an organization that hasn't received support more than twice in the last seven years so it's really about also opening it up the program up to small scale actors who could be smaller grassroots organizations who have a limited number of employees or a limited reach and we're going to focus on vocational education training, but just so that you aware, are aware that there are a number of sectors that you can apply for funding under for small scale partnerships. You can apply under vocational education training, you can apply under school education, youth or adult education. So specifically looking at vocational education training, which is the theme of today's webinar. So there is a specific definition for vocational education training under the Erasmus Plus program. And it states that vocational education training is to be understood as education training that aims to equip young people and adults with knowledge, skills, and competencies required in particular occupations or more broadly on the labor market. It might be provided in formal or non-formal settings, and it can be at all levels of the European qualifications framework. What that means is it can apply to vocational training at right from secondary level up to tertiary level. So your university level, if it's applicable. So it's quite a broad definition in terms of vocational education and training. And as well as that, for the purpose of Erasmus+, Plus, we are not only focused on initial um, vocational education training, but we also focus on continuing vocational education and training. And what does that mean for organ Irish organisations? It means that uh, initial vocational education training focuses on further education in Ireland. That's what we really call it in Ireland. So we're looking at levels five and six of the National Framework of Qualifications. Continuing vocational education training is more broad. It's about any training or upskilling for those in the workplace. So we might also look at it as continuing professional development. So just to note that your application, if you're applying under vocational education training, it really needs to have an upskilling element to it, either on those initial vocational skills or on skills that are relevant to working in the workplace or your job or um, skills to develop your employment opportunities. So anything that really um, you need to ensure that your, 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 your cooperation with your partners is about your up ability to upskill your staff or employees or your target groups and you need to be able to demonstrate that new skills or competencies have been achieved and that they'll enhance the work or the employability of those participating and I'm going to provide um, some thoughts and some examples of this a little bit later on but that's what vocational education training is under Erasmus plus so why should you take part well there's a lot of benefits for you and your organization First of all, it can help address problems within your organization or your target groups. It can improve the quality uh, of the work of your organization. It can help your organization and the individuals in that organization learn new skills and new tools. And also, it can really help increase motivation and satisfaction in the workplace. And that's some of the, the main feedback that we get from projects, from organizations who've participated in this program. It's really about the, you know, that sense of, you know, 
uh, working on something new, working on something different, collaboration, and that, you know, those uh, access to different cultures, working with other organizations in different countries. There's the travel element as well. So that can be really motivating to staff who are working within your organizations. And it's also it can involve learners as well uh, from your target group. So it can widen that sense of motivation and excitement to the learners and other participants who are participating in the pro uh, in the projects outside of your own organization as well. So the benefits for the European Union and why they really provide this funding is at a top level, it's looking to provide better quality education training and youth work. It's looking to increase links between business and education, and it does this by allowing different types of organizations to work together. So as uh, maybe a, an organization working in the community and voluntary sector, you might have the opportunity through Erasmus Plus to work with organizations from maybe the business sector or you know, an educational organization. So it does provide those opportunities for kind of cross-sectoral collaboration among different types of organizations. And it's also a real driver to try and increase inclusivity and access to education. And you'll see when we look at the different priorities of the program in a few minutes, that there's a really a focus on that uh, inclusivity and access to education. And it's also about increasing employability. So by allowing ourselves, allowing our employees and uh, participants to upskill and learn new skills and competencies, then it's all about increasing their employability and our employability as well to be able to access different types of um, uh, uh, education and employment. So in order to try and drive the, the, the different benefits and the different priorities and policies that the European Union has, it has outlined a number of different priorities that projects have to focus on. And it is important to understand what these priorities are whenever you're thinking of availing of funding onto the programme. So um, we have what's called cross-sectoral priorities or horizontal priorities. And those priorities are relevant to all the different sectors that I mentioned earlier, not just vocational education and training. And then the EU also have priorities for each sector. Um, so they'll have specific priorities for vocational education and training. And we'll look at those in a few minutes. So you really, when you're applying for funding, you really only need to look at addressing one of those priorities. So you either address a horizontal priority, and we'll, we'll, we'll explain what the, hard on, the horizontal priorities are, or you address one sector specific priority. And they're really quite broad, the priority. So most projects find that their project aims and objectives can align to at least one priority. So the, I think what we really focus on today is those horizontal priorities, because as I said, they're the main priorities of the programme for 2021 to 2027. And most organisations um, can, uh, you know, address um, different types of uh, aspects of these priorities. So the priorities, there's four main horizontal priorities. The first one is inclusion and diversity. The second is digital transformation, and that's addressing digital transformation through development of digital re uh, readiness and resilience. And then it's about environment and fight against climate change. That's the third one. And the fourth one is looking at common values so such as civic engagement and participation in society. So we look at the first one, inclusion and diversity. It's about reaching out to people with fewer opportunities and um, addressing barriers and really helping the um, providing help with program participation, as well as contributing to creating inclusive environments that foster equality, equity and equality. And also to note that the commission has recently developed an inclusion and diversity strategy. So, you know, if you're thinking of a applying for funding under this priority, it's really important to have a look at that strategy. And the link um, here, um, you can see I've, I've got a, a link to that Erasmus Plus inclusion and diversity strategy, strategy. So that's a link there. And you can take a look at it afterwards and see what the strategy is at EU level. And then digital transformation, it's about really trying to manage the shift 
the continuous shift really towards digital education. And, you know, we see that it's changing all the time, you know, looking at development of digital pedagogy and tools. Look just recently at the shift, the dramatic and fast shift to artificial intelligence and what that means for us all as organizations. So the funding there is there to really help us, you know, work with those shifts towards digital transformation and digital readiness within our organizations. Um, it's also about developing innovative digital content and developing our skills uh, in relation to using digital technology. Another, the third priority is environment and fight against climate change. So that's really about developing competencies in the sustainability sectors and also developing different sustainability competencies and re green competencies across all sectors. It's about helping um, everybody like such as learners, staff, youth workers, like really to become agents of change in relation to the environment and is supporting us all to change our individual habits and lifestyles. And there's a framework there that the Commission has developed. It's about all the different types of competencies that they're, they envisage people should have in relation to sustainability. And it's called the Green Comp Framework. Again, there's a link in the slides to that. And finally, civic engagement, it's about promoting active citizenship, making sure that citizens, uh, citizens of the European Union, they develop social and intercultural competencies, because we are, um, we are a continent with obviously a wide range of languages and cultural backgrounds. So that's really important. Uh, and also, obviously, you know, as we welcome more and more um, different types of cultures from other continents as well into our countries. It's really important to help uh, support that and help to develop our competencies for interculturalism. And it's about increasing opportunities for participation in democratic, social and civic engagement and raising awareness of EU values. So I think a lot of different types of organisations can recognise something that they're trying to do in their own organisations that can align with all those different types of priorities. And then, as I said, we are focusing specifically on vocational education and training. So there, the, there are um, about six priorities that are highlighted for specifically for vocational training. And they're about addressing labor market needs. So what are the different skills and competencies that are needed on the labor market now? It's about making um, continuing voc vocational training more flexible, allowing more people to participate it participate in it it's about new new um, ideas and new approaches and that whole area of innovation in vocational training it's about also trying to increase the attractiveness of vocational education and training by um uh, you know introducing um different possibilities for those who want to participate and also about you know quality assurance how can we ensure that vocational education training meets certain standards and finally, there's a relatively recent priority about internationalization, and that's really more geared towards probably those um, more formal education institutions who want to support learners to um, travel um, to other countries. Um, so it's uh, supporting them in their internationalization capacity and their internationalization strategies as organizations. So those are the six main priorities on vocational education training. As I said, you only need to address one priority, either under the horizontal priorities or under a sectoral priority. So there's lots of scope there um, when you're thinking of applying for Erasmus Plus funding. And then I mentioned that, you know, it is an education and training program, Erasmus Plus. So you can't just use the funding for maybe, you know, promoting the services of your organization, for example. There has to be a focus on learning and development in your application and in your projects. So I just wanted to have a quick focus on, you know, uh, thoughts about what, what does that mean in terms of by participating in these projects, what type of skills can you actually gain? And it's something that organizations, when they're applying for funding, they don't really think about so well, and it's not so well articulated in their applications. You know, um, a lot of the time they say, oh, we'll benefit from cooperating with other organizations, and you will, but they're not really outlining what type of skills or learning they'll receive from participating with those or cooperating with those organizations. 
So it's really about, um, you know, developing specific skills such as, you know, if we look at this, I don't know if you, many of you have heard of the term transversal skills. So it's those skills that are really are applicable across different jobs. Um, they're not they're not specific to one different job or one different organi one specific organization. And um, so they'd be broader skills like communication skills, problem solving, collaboration digital language, cultural understanding and creativity and innovation. Those just are just some examples of the type of skills that you might think about gaining um, when you're um, participating in an Erasmus Plus project. Or you might be wanting to focus as well on um, skills specific to your own area, your own sector that you work in, such as could be health and social care, could be the arts, could be retail or tourism, wherever you're working, what are the, the specific sectoral skills that you can benefit from by working with organisations from other countries. So perhaps we can just maybe take uh, a minute or two, you could just, um, you know, type in in the chat, just if you want to have a think just for a minute or two about what skills do you think that you could gain from working with another organization in another country. I just want to put your ideas in the chat. Um, just take a couple of minutes to have a think about that because it's really an important focus of the um, Erasmus program. And, you know, especially for vocational education training where it's really about learning and development and focusing on that aspect of your organization and their, what needs, what learning and development needs your organization might have and how they can benefit from it. So I'll just take a look. Negotiation, yeah, very good. Um, absolutely. That's a really important skill. Uh, and I can assure you, having spent 15 years working uh, with on the working group for Erasmus Plus and working with about an average of about 15 national agencies on that working group, you really hone your negotiation skills when you're working with uh, different countries who have lots of different ideas and lots of different points of view and approaches. So, yeah, really important skill and um, creativity and innovation. Absolutely. Collaboration, cultural understanding. Yeah. And collaboration, it could be like, you know, um, something specific to do with maybe leading a team, for example, or working with the team. Maybe that's not something you have an opportunity to do within your own organization. Um, so, you know, working with other organizations might bring you the possibility of that. Digital problem solving. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, by working on a lot of these projects, we're collaborating. And this was especially important during the pandemic because we all had to collaborate online. And that was a real chance for people to upskill digitally as well. Uh, and that is uh, definitely a big focus of these projects, because while you might meet in person, uh, as you'll see from the, the presentation from the way later, there's definitely a lot of work that goes on digitally and working online as well so that's very important and um, yeah so that whole area of like cultural understanding and innovation and um yeah it, somebody's mentioned a specific one immersion education so that's obviously something that's you know important to you as an organization so it's important to think about yeah how can we actually hone these skills that are important to us as an organization um volunteer training and development yes so that would be um uh, you know volunteers generally are not paid so if you're just to say that under vocational education and training um the 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 focus would need to be on those people who are paid or you know are, are in the workplace and are working with volunteers for example and the wheel is a perfect example of an organization who's been working on a project uh, on that theme um yeah so um and somebody's talking there's somebody has given a, a, you know an input on a specific um skill that's important to them you know such as mental health in schools yeah so that's an area where you might have a specific need for certain types of skills and certain types of experience that you really would want to tackle from a, a, a different perspective such as from a cult cultural perspective language of course yeah really important as well i mean a lot of these projects obviously happen through english but you have the opportunity to travel to other countries and really get a chance to to practice your language skills if you want to do so when you're there so lots of great ideas coming in there and yeah and it, it, i just wanted to make sure to kind of to highlight that to make sure that you know there are when you're applying for funding it's about 
thinking about those skills um, that you can gain as an organization, specifically for your own organizations and the people working in them, but also for your target groups as well, if you have really direct links with those target groups. So great. Thank you for that. I think we've definitely got the idea in terms of the skills that that uh, you might want to focus on in on when you're thinking of how these projects can help you uh, increase your skills or um, competencies. So thank you for that. So we'll look at the how now. <laughs> I know um, uh, when I was uh, I was teaching for a while back in, in Scotland and uh, coming from Northern Ireland, this was one of the uh, words uh, the, the, these whole words around how and I um, it was definitely one of those points where the kids were um, honing in on and uh, really enjoying uh, making the most of my pronunciation <laughs> coming from Northern Ireland. So we're looking at the how. Um, so how can you undertake um, uh, the activities? So there's different formats for the activities. You can have you can carry out your activities together with the other countries. So you can have transnational activities or they can have a national focus. Um, but if they have an, if you're just carrying out an activity nationally, it, it has to have a focus on um, working towards the aim of your transnational project, because these are not national projects, they're transnational projects. And the idea is that the partners work together on shared needs. So whatever your needs are, and you mentioned a lot of them there, like for example, working in the area of mental health, um, you know, what are the, your partners need to also have a vested interest in working in that area and it needs to benefit them. So that's your transnational shared needs. Uh, and you can carry out activities at a national level as long as they feed into the overall objective of your project in terms of the, the overall transnational objectives of and needs of the project. You can carry out more formal activities um, or you can carry non-formal non learning activities and non-formal learning for the purposes of the program is really about learning that takes place outside formal education and training but it's about planned activities though it's not just you know ad hoc learning it's about planned activities and um, they have to have learning objectives they have to have some learning time and also some sort of uh, some form of learning support as well some examples of different activities the projects carry out, they host workshops, they carry out training sessions with the partners all together or own, within their own um, target groups nationally, they develop small project results, or if it's a cooperation par partnership, the larger partnerships might develop more innovative, um, wider reaching results. They carry out meetings, they can carry out study visits, and they also, um, very importantly, need to have an aspect of sharing and promoting the outcomes and the learning from the from the projects that they participated in. So now I'm just going to provide a few examples of small scale partnerships and um, just to give you a flavor for um, the types of projects that people have applied for in recent times. We don't have so many small scale partnerships examples from Ireland, I'm sorry to say, because it is still, still a relatively new strand and, and the, those part projects are really only kicking off and we haven't funded so many of them. So there's definitely lots of scope for funding under small scale partnerships if that's what you're interested in applying for. One project that we have funded recently is a vocational training project aiming to share experience and deliver training in localized sustainable food systems to food service industry professionals. So who's participating in that project? Well, it's an environmental charity and then a small medium consultancy from Ireland, both from Ireland, and they're working with a European pu public body um, that's involved in sustainability and the food industry and they're from Greece. So that's the two countries kind of covered in the project. And um, what activities are they undertaking? They're developing um, a one day training workshop and they're also going to pilot the workshop with local participants in each country. So they're developing the workshop together and then they're piloting it with work local participants. And they're also jointly going to create a, sust a sustainable cookbook and ingredient alternative guide. So that's one example. And they focused, obviously, on that priority of environment. So looking at the priority of digital transformation, um, I have an example of a project that's aimed at improving digital entrepreneurship uh, or uh, digital and entrepreneurship skills of musicians or people working in the music sector. And um, involved in this project, this is an example of a project from Italy, and they have an association of accordion players. So it's led by Italy, but they also have a music school in Lithuania involved in it and a social enterprise in France. And they're looking at designing a curriculum um, 
for professional skills and competencies linked to green transition, digital innovation. So it's essentially to help people working in that industry, um, you know, improve their digital skills and their entrepreneurship skills and digital and um, uh, green green transition skills that will help support their music um, uh, business. Um, and they're going to look at uh, delivering workshops to experiment with um, these approaches that they developed during the project and then put them into practice um, through the curriculum that they've developed. And then lastly, just an example of a, par a project that's targeting the inclusion and diversity priority. This project is called Transit and it aims to provide a training course for health professionals, judges and lawyers who in various ways provide assistance to the LGBTQ community. So the different types of organizations, again, this project is led by Italy and um, it's an NGO who deals with LGBTQ rights in Italy and then also an association of public bodies and a vet training provider. So let's just give you an example of the different types of organizations that can work together on these projects to provide a common outcome that can benefit them all. So the activities, they're, they're going to create a training model and methodological guidelines and a training kit for that target group of health professionals, judges and lawyers. Um, they're going to implement a pilot workshop and then they're going to carry out sharing and promotion activities to share the outputs of the project more widely. Okay, so that's all that I, I wanted to stay, say at this point, and I hope that provides a good overview of the of the, the the general aspects of cooperation partnerships and specifically small scale partnerships so i'm going to hand back to emily now for the next presentation brilliant thanks so much Siobhan. that was a very comprehensive breakdown and look at erasmus plus and all the different kind of opportunities within the funding streams um, i think it's really helpful to kind of see the different opportunities within the small scale partnerships and and see those examples in practice so to kind of build on that, I am going to hand over to my colleague, Kathy Ann, so she can present on a vet project that The Wheel delivered um, called Foundations for Sector 3. So over to you, Kathy Ann. Thanks, Emily. You can see my screen OK? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Ann, and I work with The Wheel, and I work on our Erasmus Plus projects. And the one that I'm going to chat to you about today is one that we've recently finished. Uh, called Foundations for Sector 3. So to give you a bit of background, uh, what exactly is it? So Foundations for Sector 3, also called F4S3, it's a free and open access induction training program for the nonprofit community across Europe. So it was developed by colleagues in our sector and for our sector, and we targeted the training package at newcomers to the sector so including people like new entrants, graduates, people fresh out of college, uh, people who made a career move, so might have worked in a different industry and decided after maybe 20 years they wanted to move into the uh, voluntary sector or the nonprofit sector. People who were in need of just a bit of a refresher, so maybe they'd worked in the sector for a while, but just wanted to get some kind of background foundational knowledge again, and also for staff and volunteers. So the training package that we created uh, as part of the project is focused on four different modules. And the modules were uh, firstly, the landscape of the third sector, uh, public policy, policy and advocacy, professional skills necessary to work in the sector, and also personal skills necessary to work in the sector. So the training initially, uh, when we first kind of planned out the, the program, we saw it as a blended learning uh, program, so that there would be a mix of in-person training sessions and then some online training sessions. But due to uh, COVID, of course, uh, we had to change plans uh, in some countries due to different uh, COVID restrictions, et cetera. So what we did in Ireland anyways, was we ran our program completely fully online and as a result of that, we kind of tweaked some of our training materials to allow for this. And a really great added bonus um, from being forced to do that was we were actually able to reach participants from, let's say, outside of Dublin, people from who wouldn't have ordinarily been able to travel to um, access the training. They were able to join our uh, Zoom calls on uh, Zoom, our training. And yeah, we reached um, a lot of people that we didn't foresee reaching at the start, I suppose. 
uh, we pitched the training to level four on the European qualifications framework. So that uh, is in accordance with about kind of secondary level uh, leaving search area. So as the title suggests, it's a real foundational knowledge of the sector. So it's real kind of basic information that will get people started uh, in their careers. And we validated participants learning using digital badges. So why exactly did we want to do this project in the first place? Uh, we really saw a need for a tailored induction program for third sector workers. We wanted to provide support and freely available resources for organizations who were looking to attract and to retain talent in our sector. So I'm sure we all know that retaining uh, talent at the moment is, is a bit of a difficulty for a lot of organizations. So by having this training package, that we were able to offer freely to organizations, it would hopefully encourage people to number one, join the sector, but number two, stay in the sector because they felt like they had the necessary skills and knowledge that they needed. And we also wanted there to be a greater visibility of skills and competencies in our sectors. So we did this through using digital badges, whereby participants could share the digital badges they had earned uh, on their social media, on their LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. And it was a way to kind of certify the learning that they had done that wasn't necessarily done in a college or anything like that. So who was involved in this project? Uh, we had four project partners and all of us had a different skill set and um, different experience. And also importantly, we all had different networks. So when it came to actually promoting the project towards the end and when we had project results, ready to share with people. We all had different networks that we were able to share it with. So we had ourselves in the wheel. Uh, we were the project lead and we led on one element of content development. Then uh, this project was back when the UK were uh, able to be um, project participants, our uh, partners. So we had the Wales Council for Voluntary Action who also supported on content development. Then we had the University of Bamberg from Germany and they led on our validation framework. So they assessed all of the data that we received after running the uh, pilot training programs. And they really assessed it to see had we made an impact. Uh, and then we had the Civis Study Center from Finland who led on dissemination and our transferability report. So just in, time, in terms of the timeline of the project, we kicked off in December, 2020, and we wrapped it up in November, 2022. How did we do it? Uh, we did it um, through Erasmus Plus funding. And as I said, it was a two year project ran over 24 months and it fell under the key action to partnership for cooperation. And we were supported by Lergus and Siobhan was our point of contact for the program. And the support that we received from Siobhan and her colleagues really was really excellent, particularly when COVID kind of came into the mix and we had to adapt some of our uh, plans, things like that. It was really great to have Lergus on hand to advise us on what the next steps were, how we could maneuver things around. So speaking of COVID, uh, this project, we kind of had a plan to do it one way. And then of course, COVID decided to, um, to get in the way a little bit. So uh, it actually created a lot of uncertainty around planning. So we were going ahead with uh planning events that were going to take place for example we had a training event that was going to take place in wales over the course of a week and then due to people contracting covid uh flight restrictions different things this activity had to be moved completely online and so we did some of our activities fully virtually and because of that we really needed to put in place uh good team building at the very start of the project and we had to uh, really establish a core team that we were able to communicate effectively online because as you can see on the slide here we actually weren't able to meet in person until month 16 of the project so we were well over halfway through the project before we actually got to meet in person and um, so we really had to make sure we had the foundation of a good team structure and we were able to communicate effectively online and it really did teach all the partners uh, myself included how to effectively work um, online with other partners and kind of, you know, we all were facing difficulties with long Zoom calls, all of that, but it really did give us um, a new set of skills, which then equipped us 
to deliver the pilot training programs online. We were actually a lot more comfortable online by the time that they came around. Uh, here is a picture of our final partner meeting, uh, which was in Dublin in September last year. And I'm happy to report that all partners were able to attend. We all finally uh, got to meet, which was great and COVID didn't get in the way of that. So then just moving on to our project results. So the goal of the project, I suppose, initially, uh, we had a successful application following some background work. And in December 2020, we set out to form a project team who would combine each of our unique skills. and We would all work together to create the Valorized Induction Training Program for the third sector in Europe. And we really wanted to offer a means of recognition and validation of new skills and competencies that people gain through our program. So we did this through digital badges. So what did we actually achieve um, throughout the two pilot rotations that we did? So there was two pilot rotations of the training program done in each of the four countries. And as a result of that happening in each of the four countries, we actually have the materials now available in English, Finnish, Welsh and German. So uh, even though English was the project language, uh, we have resources available in all four partner languages, which is brilliant. We trained 14 uh, trainers in the foundations for sector three program. So we now have 15 trainers available across Europe to deliver the program, which is great. Uh, we had 105 learners across the four partner countries. And then we had 82 meta digital badges awarded to participants. So what the meta digital badges were, they were um, given to participants who had completed all four modules of the program. So if you had participated and completed all four modules, you were then counted in the 82 meta badges. And then we had 105 learners total who participated at different stages throughout the program, but may not necessarily have completed all four. Uh, we were happy to see uh, through the validation framework that there was an increase in participant confidence reported in all four partner countries, in all four modules and in both pilot rotations. And if you're interested, uh, we also have our project website, which is f4s3.eu and all of our training materials are available to download freely. Should you or uh, somebody that you know maybe want to access our induction training program, you are more than free to do so. Uh, just before I wrap up, in terms of learnings from this program, uh, what we really saw as a key strength of the program was peer learning. So not only did our pilot participants remark that they were learning from the trainers, they were actually learning a huge amount from each other uh, throughout, the, throughout the program. And it was great that they were able to kind of look at their own experiences, talk about how one person handles something, how they would advise the next person. So that was a really great added benefit that we saw and it was reported by the majority of our participants. Uh, the timing of the course in one's career is vital. So the earlier that somebody could either get their hands on the training materials or participate in the course, the better it was because it gave them that uh, basic foundational, foundational knowledge to then move forward into their career. Um, we also did a pre-training survey with all of our pilot participants before they started the programme. And it really did show us that there was a lack of knowledge um, and skills in the sector that participants felt that they just weren't confident in different areas, particularly like public policy, policy and advocacy. So it really um, strengthened our kind of, I suppose, belief that yes, that this training programme was needed. And a really nice benefit of um, the programme was a lot of the pilot participants off their own bat went ahead and created um, a LinkedIn group. So they created their own kind of networks organically uh, without us kind of encouraging it. They went ahead and I know that these LinkedIn groups are still active and they've created their own little networks now that they can go to each other if they have a problem, uh, which is a great benefit as well. So just to conclude, uh, the program was a really rich learning experience for our partnerships, particularly the kind of COVID issues that we came across and having to adapt to things online and work it that way. And um, we did definitely learn a lot and all of us improved our, our digital skills. Um, 
we sought out the expertise of and collaborated with European partners, which really did act as a catalyst for us achieving some of our organizational goals and our missions. Uh, we also built a sustainable consortium of partners and all of us have committed to sustaining the project results in future. And I was actually only speaking to our Finnish partner uh, this week, and they're in the middle of running another round of the training right now, and they have 43 participants this week uh, taking part. So even though the project is finished, it doesn't mean that the resources just get put to the side. They're still actively being used um, as well as with us in the wheel, and we are sharing our resources and hopefully going to offer another training round very shortly. And importantly, all of our partners are interested in working together again, which we were delighted uh, to find out. And it really means that uh, we had a successful project. All of us felt we could communicate um, easily and openly with each other. And hopefully the opportunity will arise again for us to work together. So that is it for me. Thank you very much. Um, I can share the link to our website uh, in the chat if you're interested. And yeah, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, Emily. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, I might be a bit biased, but I think that that project's a really excellent example of um, just how Erasmus Plus funding can create kind of sustainable resources, not just for your organization, but kind of for the wider voluntary community as well. Um, and I also really like that you kind of illustrated that it's not without challenges. That's the reality of these kinds of projects, but with a strong partnership, you can overcome most of those challenges um, and risks. So thank you for that. So um, before we move on to the Q&A, and I see a lot of great questions coming into the chat there, what we wanted to do was kind of get some of your initial reactions, um, thoughts and feedback about Erasmus Plus now that you've heard from Siobhan and Kathy Ann. So we're gonna do that using Menti. So I'm gonna pop the Menti link into the chat. Um, you should be able to access it and there will be three questions that come up. So just bear with me as I copy and paste this link for you. Okay, so you can access that, or if you want to use um, access it on your phone, you can go to menti.com and use the code, which is here. So I will also just pull that up so we can have a look at the questions. I see some of them already coming in. So great, you guys are ahead of the game. Right, so we've got three questions here. So the first is, how do you feel about Erasmus Plus VET projects? So very positive, great, excited, uh, great opportunity, hopeful, empowering, unsure. Useful, love to get involved, adaptable. Excellent, this is very encouraging. Uh, and then the next slide is, uh, or the next question rather is, what kind of supports would you need to apply for or participate in an Erasmus Plus VET project? And then the last one here is, will you make an application for an Erasmus Plus VET project in the future? So I'll give everybody just a couple minutes uh, to answer these. And this will be open for a while um, after the, the session today, so you can answer them later on as well. Um, so there's no mad pressure. Okay, so hopefully this is helpful for you, Siobhan. It looks like you have done your job very well. <laughs> We've got a lot of excited and interested people, enthusiastic people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's okay to feel unsure still at this point. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there can be a lot of information to take in as well, um, which can be definitely overwhelming. But yeah, hopefully my job is to try and make that a little bit easier for, for people. Yeah. Okay, and just some of the answers here about what kind of supports would you need? So how do we find partners, um, support and application process, funding and advisory consultation supports, where could we discuss potential ideas for new projects? And we can address for sure some of these questions in the Q&A. Um, great. And then just the poll. Great. So eight people 
making an application in the future for people unsure. And so far, no no's. So I would say it's job well done. <laughs> okay. So I might just stop sharing now. And as I mentioned, that'll be open if people want to continue contributing to it. And that's all very useful information to know so that Siobhan um, and us here in Access Europe can kind of better do our jobs and better support people to apply for these kinds of projects. Okay, so let us officially kick off the Q&A session. So I saw a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just gonna scroll to the top here. And what do we have? So, okay, so Alan had a question about language barriers. So Siobhan, do you want to address that in terms of how communication and the official language of Erasmus Plus works? Yeah, I can, but I think it might also be good to hear from you guys because you have that experience as well, working directly with the, the different partners. But generally, you know, um, most of these projects take place through English. Um, we're very lucky in that respect in that um, language, uh, English really is the, the, the language that's mainly in use across Europe. Now, that doesn't mean that within specific partner organizations, there are people who don't speak English as well. So that's all part of the communication um, uh, learning and challenges within work uh, for working on an Erasmus Plus project because it can be about finding different ways for us as English speakers to communicate more clearly with the other countries who are not necessarily working in their 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 native language. So I don't know if you've got anything to add on that. Yeah, I mean, Kathy Ann, is there anything that you found kind of helpful, like tool wise, when you were working with people in Finland and, and Germany? Yeah, so uh, all of our project partners that we worked with, they were all fluent in English. Um, however, there was definitely instances where, um, you know, you would have to make a conscious effort to really plain Englishify, if I can say that, uh, your communications to partners. And what we actually found was really, really interesting was when we were creating our resources, we would have had words like advocacy, in Ireland and commonly used words like that. And when we went to our Finnish partners, they said, no, 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 that doesn't exist in Finland. Uh, like we don't have that word. So we were actually coming across things like that. And it was a good learning for us because we just took it for granted that, you know, everybody would have some sor sort of translation. And when you come across things like that, you, uh, what we found is very helpful to have a call with them to explain it to them as we see it. And then you lo and behold are able to find another solution in their language. But uh, I would say that all the projects that we've worked on, English has been the partner language and all the part or the project language and all of the partners have had English, but it is definitely on us as we would see it to make the communications quite accessible. Um, and if someone doesn't understand anything to offer to have a call with them as well, uh, just to make sure everyone's on the right track. Perfect. I think like in a, my previous life working on these kinds of projects, we had partner like eight different partners and they had varying levels of English. Um, and so we would have Skype calls regularly, which kind of shows how old the project was now. Nobody uses Skype anymore. <laughs> but there are people that were pretty silent on the calls and we would kind of, you know, connect with them afterwards and ask if everything was OK. And it was a lot of times that people were a bit like shy or kind of, you know, reticent about their English skills. And so we kind of made a rule in the project that people should be, like feel comfortable using the chat and the Skype if they didn't want to actually speak. So that way that they could feel comfortable communicating their views and still giving an input to the project as well. So even kind of like practical things like that, just kind of making sure that you're being very approachable and understanding about people's kind of level of comfort with different kind of aspects of transnational working is useful to keep in mind. Um, okay, which organization manages the money awarded? Well, that would be the organization, what we call the applicant organization. So that's the organization that decides to lead the project. Um, so if it's an Irish organization that decides to lead the project, then you would apply for funding to, to, to Lergus as the um, Irish national agency. If it's the uh, organization in, for example, France that decides to lead it, then they would apply to the French national agency for funding. But all of these projects are based on one organization taking the lead uh, and then the others are called, so they're called the applicants and then the rest are the, called the partners. Um, and, and that's basically how the, the funding works. So they, the lead, the applicant organization would receive the funding 
on behalf of the other partners and then they'll share out the funding after they've received it so that everybody can carry out the different tasks that they're they've agreed to carry out great um and a good question here around the kind of environmental aspects of the projects and now with the emergence of zoom is funding for travel now less acceptable um, at the end of the day, these are still cultural and education programs. And, you know, it can be very difficult to get a flavor of somebody's culture and really, um, you know, f um, find that cultural understanding without visiting that country and 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 being in, in person in that country. So uh, it's 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 not um, it, the, the travel has aspect has not gone. But what we are what we're promoting instead is that previously projects would have maybe you know flown and met just to have a meeting to talk about the organization of the project and that might have only taken place over maybe a day a day and a half so that's definitely being discouraged now in the program what we're looking at is that if you're going to meet as a partnership which you really should do at least once during the lifetime of your project then it's it's more about being able to work together exchange it could be a training it could be a, um, a you know an, an information exchange it could be working on developing the outcomes together but it's using that time together to really um, maximize the, um, the, the the transnational cooperation and the exchange and the development and the learning together as opposed to just meeting to um, organize the, the the kind of budget or the finances or the administration uh, of the or the project management of the, the project so it's that's the, the focus going forward and you can carry out those project management activities online then uh, as opposed to an, uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting. Gotcha and just on the finance topic is there a best practice ratio for funding allocation for example travel accommodation trainers fees how ideally should no. it look? No. no, there isn't. So the good question, but these are lump sum funding projects. So that what that means now is that you receive the, the lump sum funding that you've applied for based on what activities that you said that you would carry out. So you have to describe your own activities. You have to describe what you want to do in the project. First of all, you have to describe what your aims are, and then you're going to describe your activities as how you're going to achieve those aims. So it's totally up to you um, and your partner organizations to agree on what activities that you'll carry out and how they'll achieve those aims. And when your project's evaluated, if it's considered that those activities are, you know, suitable to achieve the aims that you've outlined and that, you know, that the budget is value for money, that it's, you know, you're not spending too much money on one aspect that's, you know, not really that important or uh, another aspect, um, you know, uh, that's not really relevant, then then that you know that would be taken into account at application stage but the idea is that you decide what activities you're going to carry out and how you're going to use the money so it will be assessed and um, it's not just you know here you know i'm applying for sixty thousand, and you know uh, that, that that's that's okay you know depending what you want to spend the money on but it has to be relevant to the activities that you're carrying out but it's very much with lump sum funding it's up to the organizations who are applying to decide on how that's going to be broken down. Great. Um, is there a requirement for training outcomes methodologies to be open source at the end of the project? Yes, there absolutely is. So um, that's one of the principles of Erasmus Plus, that whatever you develop during the project life cycle has to be made freely available at the end of the project. And we actually have an Erasmus Plus project results platform. That's a shared European platform where you have to upload your results at the end of the project. And all those results can be freely accessed by anybody who's searching the platform. And a practical question, what are the deadlines for applying? So there are normally, for, it depends on the type of project that you're applying for. So for cooperation partnerships, which are the larger type of projects, that's uh, only really got one deadline a year. And it's usually around towards the third week in March. So you can only apply once a year for that. For small scale partnerships, then we have two compulsory deadlines a year, again, around the third week in March. And then the second one is usually in October, the beginning of October. So the next deadline, which is for small scale partnerships, is this October. It's going to be the 4th of October. Excellent. Um, and there's a question on outcomes. Are there specific kinds of outcomes required or is that pretty open? 
it's definitely open and it depends on the it depends on what you're actually developing and what the aims of your project are so you know it doesn't especially for small scale partnerships i mean obviously with the the wheels project um, that you know it was a it was a larger project so you were developing really you know quite um uh, content intensive uh, modules there with a lot of content a lot of you know maybe a lot of graphics you're hosting it on a, a platform and you have you know then in fact you have also an accreditation the the the, the digital badge accredited to it so it, it that's really an example of of a large scale project for in terms of a large scale outcome in terms of smaller scale projects the outcomes can be um, much um, more in proportion to the funding that you're going to receive so it could be for example a, a framework for a future training activity that you might want to implement so you might not have to develop all that content as such but you might have a framework for the how you're going to do that and that would be agreed among the your partners you could have maybe examples of case studies. You could have case studies of best practice that you might want to, you know, digital case studies that you might want to develop together as a partnership. Um, or you could have, you know, you I, I showed some of the examples in the example projects that I went through there. You know, one, uh, one of the projects is developing a small cookbook with recipes for sustainable uh, recipes. Um, another one was developing a training framework, you know, not a not the whole content of it, you know. So it's it really has to depend on your own project needs, but it has to be in proportion to the funding that you're receiving as well. Thank you for that. Um, and then there's a question, um, are you guys running a small scale partnership training session? Yes, so we will be before the next deadline, and that normally will take place at the beginning of September. So the the application workshops where we go into how to actually fill in your application form, how to apply, that usually takes place about four weeks or so, between six, four and six weeks uh, before the deadline. We try to make it six weeks to give people more time. Uh, it can be a bit difficult because with the October deadline because it's over the summer and then sometimes people are less available, but we always record the sessions as well. So if you can't make the session, you'll be able to access the recording. And of course, you'll be able to contact us with any questions you have when you're actually completing your application form. Great. And then we have a few questions about finding partners. So I know my Access Europe response to that, um, but if you want to yeah and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna cover it as well in my next okay. steps so. okay yeah great so uh for the people that ask questions about how you find partners or if there's a partner finding a platform we will get to those questions um shortly um but just wanted to throw it out there does anybody else have any questions that have not yet been answered Right. So then we might just move on, Siobhan, if you want to do uh, your next steps. Sure. So yeah, hopefully this is going to uh, address some of the other questions that we, we didn't get to there. Uh, oh, sorry, not a good idea to do it from the beginning. I have a few slides just to address some of those, especially around the partner finding, because that can be uh, really important, obviously, for people who are just making those first steps into the Erasmus Plus funding or that European partnership funding. So, as I said, partner finding is usually the biggest concern whenever you're first trying to reach out to this type of funding. There are a number of um, online platforms that have been designed for finding, trying to help you find partners. Um, I don't know um, if many of you have heard of the Apala platform and um, that's essentially um, the electronic platform for adult learning in Europe and it's got lots of information there about different types of um, funding different types of projects uh, it, it, it's also got blogs on any lots of different themes to do with adult learning uh, and that covers more than just vocational education training because obviously it covers adult learners in the workplace but it also covers general adult um, skills of people maybe who aren't in the workplace it, they could be in you know maybe um, in, in volunteering or they could be just you know, trying to uh, improve their basic skills uh, in terms of what what we would know know as adult education here. So yeah, it's it's about um, there there is a a, um, a partner finding section on the platform, 
And also on the platform, there's a new community um, called the Community of European Vet Practitioners. And you can sign up to be a member of that community. And then that's also a good way to, to find different practitioners across Europe who might be willing to uh, start up a project with you. We also, in Lurgis, we also host and also send people to transnational cooperation activities. These can be often uh, contact making seminars. So they're, they're generally contact making seminars that are on a specific theme uh, to help you find partners, uh, you know, related to that theme and related to the area that you want to work with. Or, or they can be general contact making seminars. For example, we hosted one or, or we co-hosted one in Denmark in November last year, and it was on small scale partnerships. And it was bringing people from like across all the four different sectors to try and find partners uh, on different uh, themes to help them really take that first step into Erasmus Plus. So do keep an eye on the Transnational Cooperation Activities section of the Lergus website, because there you'll see all of the upcoming um, TCAs, as they're known as. Um, so it's just important that you understand that terminology. That's what it stands for, and that's what it actually means. It allows you to cooperate um, with other partners in other countries and find those partners um, to help you take the first step into Erasmus Plus funding. And they're really a successful way of being able to find partners in Erasmus Plus. And um, that's just to say as well that those are the kind of resources that are available as well when you're starting out in Erasmus Plus. You will have to unfortunately delve into the rather hefty Erasmus Plus program guide. But again, we can help you with that and pinpoint to you to the particular section. Now that you know if you want to start out, you just need to go to the small scale partnerships section in the program guide. We also have a publication developed by the EU called How to Communicate Your Project. And that's really useful for when you're thinking about the promotional aspects of your project and how you can further communicate it with other organizations outside your own organization. And then finally, we developed um, a handbook a few years ago called European Project Management in Transnational Partnership Projects. And it's got lots of ideas and um, you know tips in there in terms of different aspects of managing a transnational partnership project. So if you click on the links in my presentation you'll get access to all of those as well also we host regular events um for example an application workshop that will be coming up for the uh, small scale partnerships um and, and again if you click on that link there in this presentation largus events eventbrite all they're they're all advertised on eventbrite and you'll see all the events coming up that you can attend and you can also sign up. It's really important to do this as well as to sign up for the Largus newsletter, because there you can say which sectors you're interested in. So if you want to get the vocational education tra training news newsletter, we have one for each sector. Then you can sign up to that and you'll be able to see any. Um, we always advertise upcoming events in the newsletter as well. So lots of ways there to get access to any more events, but also um, some ideas about how to find partners as well. Okay, and that's it. Great. So we sure might just do my kind of wrap up of supports available from Access Europe. So do that. Okay. Great. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, so Access Europe is a program that is delivered by The Wheel, um, and it's an EU funding support service for Irish civil society. So to basically help civil society organizations, no matter how big or small, to access these kinds of EU funding opportunities, and once they do access them, to help them manage it relatively painlessly. So some of the services that we provide um, are updates on EU funding programs like Erasmus Plus and their deadlines. So what we do is kind of research all the relevant funding deadlines for civil society organizations, and we put them on our website at accesseurope.ie, and we also disseminate them out in a free monthly newsletter um, that you can sign up to. So we've kind of done a lot of the hard work for you, so you don't have to kind of go trawling through thousands of calls to find the right one for you. So we also deliver training and events like this one, where we invite the national contact points to come and talk about their project or their programs rather, so you can ask them questions directly. And we also do just kind of general trainings like how to design your EU project um, or how to better engage with EU policy that's relevant to your organization. We also provide one-to-one -one advice. So if you don't know where to start with EU funding, we can meet with you, hear about your project ideas and signpost you to the appropriate EU program for your project idea. We can do application review. And once you do get funding, we can help you to set up project management systems um, so that you can, can better run your project. 
And then finally, just on the topic of finding partners, we do um, provide networking opportunities locally and at EU level. Um, so we're actually gonna be running a training on the 7th of June on how to effectively build an EU partnership. And we're going to include a specific focus on our partner database platform. Um, so I might just share what that looks like with you all now. So we have developed this platform to kind of better help Irish organizations to showcase their organization to potential um, EU partners. So here's what it looks like. So here you can see, for example, Make a Dream Project Support Services Limited. They've created their profile here, and it just kind of shows you um, what their focus is, what their interests are, what kind of EU project experience they have. So they've got a lot and what their EU funding goals are. So what you can do is create your profile, put it on our database. Um, and what we do is then kind of shop it out to the EU, we disseminate it so that you can be invited into projects. Um, and also, you know, if you have a project idea, then you can use this profile to approach organizations directly. And it's also a really good way to, by creating your profile to kind of talk internally about how you want to use EU funding and kind of what your European development strategy internally would be like. So if you are interested in finding out more about the partner database, I would definitely recommend coming to the training on the 7th of June. I don't think it's on our website yet, but it'll be up there shortly. And also sign up to our Access Europe newsletter um, where we kind of highlight all these sort of different trainings and events. So yeah, that's it for me. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to Siobhan and to Kathy Ann for your excellent presentations. Um, and thank you all for coming out and for engaging with us. Hopefully you got a lot of good food for thought and we'll be seeing a lot of Erasmus Plus applications. Yeah, thank, thank you. And thanks very much, Emily, for, for hosting.